Well, let's get started, everyone. Thank you so much for, for attending. As John said, it's a beautiful sunny day. So what better, better way to, uh, to spend it than to you know, learn something about adoption and growth and, and how to digitize your campaign. So thank you so much for attending. It's a great pleasure to have you all here. And thank you to a wonderful panelist um, that, that has joined us here today. We'll get just started in a second to introductions, but let me just start with just some high levels about our community. Um, and, and sort of why we do what we do here. So I'll get you to jump to the next slide, um, Maria. And I have my wonderful co-host here, Maria, helping me um, push the slides and, and make sure that we, we stay on track. Um, so the point of the community just at a high level is we're here to help engage uh, customer success folk in the Vancouver area and also now completely global, um, but primarily just helping each other learn, uh, helping each other develop our careers and hopefully set the stage for making Vancouver the number one hub for customer success in the world. Um, and, and we have a wonderful group of people, including John, Jackie, Eva, Maria, and myself, all helping to put, put together these events. And so thank you so much for everyone for volunteering. Um, and if there's everyone, anyone in the community that's interested in helping out, feel free to join, to, to reach out to any one of us, um, you know, via LinkedIn or any other kind of social mechanism. Um, and, and you know, happy to help or happy to get other people uh, people's help. And so let's get started. Um, so today we'll be going through sort of who, who the guests are. We want to hear from you. We want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so we've got some slidos where we'll be um, throwing in some questions and reaching out to, for some polls and things like that. Um, but feel free to chime in. Um, this is a small group. We're 47 people. And so um, if there's any questions here and there, um, you can add it into the chat, you can add it to the Slido, or if you want, you can also uh, unmute yourself and, and raise a question where you can as well. Um, so I'd love to introduce my wonderful panel. Um, so today we have Angela from Unbounce, um, who's joined us here from Vancouver. We have Carla from Asana and Diana from Product Board, who are both in the United States. So thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today and, and sharing some time with us. And let's start with maybe Angela, would you like to provide a bit more of an introduction on who you are? Yeah, for sure, thank you. Um, my name is Angela Bucher, in case you're wondering how to pronounce it. Um, I actually go by Ange most commonly, but seem to always put Angela in, uh, in an intro slide. So I'm currently uh, at Unbounce, uh, which is uh, locally headquartered here in Vancouver. Um, I've been at Unbounce just over a year, actually started um, started during a global pandemic, so it's been quite uh, quite an interesting experience, um, but I'm loving it so far, was previously uh, at Clio, and then before that spent a good long uh, chunk of time uh, at Alita, which when I was there was called Vision Critical, and actually see some familiar faces from, from my days of Vision Critical, nice to see those faces here. Um, just to kind of, I guess, you know, share a little bit around, we, we have um, and are in the process of kind of refining what our tech stack is uh, at Unbounce, but these are the tools that we I won't read them off, but these are the tools that we uh, that we use pretty well day to day uh, and rely on uh, and function with um, the customer education piece. So just to kind of share like going down my intro slide. Uh, it really sits uh, kind of across two departments at Unbounce. So uh, I manage the customer enablement, an enablement department, which is where uh, the majority of the kind of education happens with our customers. Uh, it's the customer facing team, but we also actually have uh, quite a bit of work done in our customer marketing department as well, which is really working on the kind of scale projects, the one to many initiatives and campaigns. Um, and those are just kind of like the sub departments within those. Um, and then my gem, which is really kind of philosophies and they also happen to be books, but really philosophies that we use uh, are in the process of implementing and really rely on at Unbounce, which I highly recommend, uh, which is the two books, Scaling Up and The Effortless Experience. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Welcome to the, to the show. Um, and up next, Carla. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Carla Bagdonis, if you're wondering how to pronounce that last name. Also, not super intuitive. Um, and I'm the customer education program lead at Asana. Um, before that, I my background is actually in more traditional education. So um, I came from the K-12 education world, found a bridge with ed tech, and then have been at Asana for the last um, two years or so. Um, 
in terms of our tech stack it, for our programs, you can check out some of the tools added here, some of the tools that we use for some of our skilled programs. Uh, we might talk a little, in a little more detail later about how those things show up. Um, and in terms of thinking about where our team is situated, um, so customer education at Asana is within the customer success org. Um, and within customer success, we have sort of a, a branch for dedicated customer success and then what we're calling scaled customer success, which includes education and also um, what we call onboarding. Um, and you could also think of these as sort of like scaled CSMs who work um, in, with in time bound engagements with various customers at different points in their life cycle, as opposed to dedicated and ongoing. Um, and then in terms of my, my gem, to share with you all recommendation, um, I have two. One is the one on this slide, the Customer Education Lab podcast. If you're not plugged in to that resource, some really great conversations there um, with other customer education and CS professionals. And then the second is a community, a Slack community um, for specifically focused around customer education and scaled, scaled CS uh, efforts. So if you go to customereducation.org, you can find your way into that Slack community, which is a great place to um, crowdsource and bounce ideas off of other folks who are doing similar kinds of work. Awesome, absolutely great. And I'd love to see that you're using Asana as well. That's, that's a fantastic product. Um, so up next, uh, Diana. Hi everybody, I'm Diana. Uh, my last name is Stegall. You can pronounce it however you want. <laughs> I won't remember and I'll probably answer to any pronunciation you wanna give me. Uh, so, as was mentioned earlier, I work at Product Board uh, with John, who most of you are familiar with. Before I, Product Board, for those who aren't aware, uh, is, a, is a B2B company. We work in the tech space. Our target audience is product managers. Uh, and we work with anything from extra small business up to the enterprise sector. And my role focuses very heavily on uh, the long tail, the extra small business of small business uh, and the little guys at the bottom of the pyramid, but the bottom of the pyramid is the most important part, holds up the rest of it. Uh, before I worked at Product Board, I was working at Lever, uh, another B2B uh, tech company. They uh, were in the ATS space here in San Francisco. Uh, so I'm one of the only people in the room not based in Canada. Hi, everybody. Uh, We've got my list here of the tech stack. Most of it looks pretty familiar. I will be very honest and say, take a look at the last item on that list. If you're thinking, is everybody else doing that? Yes, yes, we are. We are all working with infinite CSVs, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> and um, at Product Board, customer education sits firmly within the customer success realm. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be talking more about some of the alternate configurations that are out there, uh, but it's a standalone org. I work very closely with, uh, you could say the equivalent of what Carla referred to as scaled CSMs. I work with a, our scaled team that focuses on one-to-many outreach and kind of uh, bound interventions rather than ongoing one-on-one -on -one relationships. I work closely with that team, but it is a separate standalone team. Uh, and my hidden gem is, the book, Customer Education by Adam Avramescu. If there's anybody here who is transitioning to customer education or thinking about it, or they've been doing it for a while and they feel like they missed out on something that everybody else knows except them, uh, I cannot recommend that book highly enough. I'm very picky about which business books I actually refer to other people. And that one I would buy three times over. I'd, I'd buy the the Kindle version and the audiobook too, if I had to, it's, it's, uh, it's worth every penny and, and just recommend it no matter where you are in your journey, anywhere in this field. Thank you so much, Diana. That's a great gem. And I've certainly had my share of, you know, wrestling infinite CSVs as well. And so definitely, um, one of the greatest tools and worst tools out there in the whole world at the same time. So thank you. Um, so great stuff. We're going to start off with um, uh, a slido here just to um, see what you guys are interested, get some, get kind of a, a sort of a list of uh, options from the, from the audience here and what you guys would like to focus us on. So if you go to either slido.com and you can put in that number 511104 uh, as a hashtag, or you can just take a picture uh, uh, of the code there and that'll get you right there. 
And so we should be able to see um, some of the answers come through here fairly quickly. Um, the question that you'll be answering first is what challenges do you have with your digital program? Um, are you not sure where to start? Are you getting customers to, um, to, to onboard or customers to drive adoption? Um, you know, things of that nature. There's quite a few listing here. So um, feel free to pick whatever, whatever is most important to you and will help guide our conversation here today. As we get going on this Slido, I wanna throw up the first question of the panel. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Carla, um, since you're first kind of on my list here in, in, in Zoom. Um, Carla, how did you start your, your, your customer education or customer adoption program at Asana? Sure. Um, so our program, I would say, evolved somewhat organically and kind of um, grassroots ground up. Um, as opposed to anyone coming in and saying top down, like we need a customer education function and we're gonna scope it all out and build it you know, from, from the top down. So the way that that evolution happened, um, really I would say the first piece was our knowledge base. So our knowledge base articles that were intended to basically unblock and support customers around support tickets. That's kind of like square one, first thing that needs to be available is an easy searchable written knowledge base. So customers can self-serve answers to their own questions and you can reduce the, the support ticket volume coming in. Um, the next step beyond that, I think for us was developing a live webinar program. And the reason for that was that we were finding our CSMs were essentially having a lot of the same conversations in, in their customer calls over and over and over again and teaching about a lot of the same product features over and over again um, in a way where we realized we could actually consolidate a lot of that good knowledge and information into a single you know, one hour training um, and deliver it in more of a one to many fashion as opposed to our CSMs having to do those trainings and repeat themselves over and over again. Um, another reason I think webinars are a great place to start is that it's really easy to experiment and iterate with webinar content. You can run a webinar one way, one week, and then you can change up the slide deck and move around the order of the content and deliver it an entirely different way the next week until you find something that really lands and really works for your customers. Um, so the next iteration after the live training program then was to actually codify some of those learning experiences into self-paced courses in our Asana Academy. Um, and I think this is a really like useful and logical way to think about the evolution um, of the programs and also of the content itself. So right now, we often won't build something into a course until we've had a chance to kind of test it out live with some people in a workshop setting, um, because it's a huge investment to actually create and build out that self-paced course. Um, so I would say uh, the Academy and then the other element that came around came about around that time was our community forum, which started on the education team. It's now managed by our community team, um, but creating that open forum and space for customers to crowdsource answers to their questions from each other and also from our um, network of pros. Um, in addition to this, there are other efforts that I'm, I'm less closely involved in, such as like lifecycle email marketing, our in-product education efforts. Those have all been sort of evolving organically all along the way, but kind of in parallel with, um, with this other ecosystem of more explicit customer education programs. That's awesome. The, the focus, uh, it looks, it sounds like you focused a lot on a customer education. Was there any, um, a goal or, or a metric or KPI or something that you, your team is sort of was driven by or, or was pushing to kind of address when you started building out your education programs? Sure. I think, um, I think one program, especially for the knowledge base, one was just reducing support ticket volume and using those um, support ticket themes to figure out how to, how to get ahead of questions through education. Um, in, in the early days of our programs, the metrics were really just engagement and satisfaction. So like how many people are showing up and how happy are they with what they got when they showed up. Um, going deeper than that, I think now we're really wanting to look more at um, correlations between engagement with education and adoption metrics. So frequency of, of product usage, how sticky um, Asana becomes for a team. So are there correlations between 
engaging with education and renewal rates, for example, or um, upgrades or expansion events, things like that. Um, so that's, I think, the world that we're headed towards is more, uh, you know, it's always the, the, um, the goal is always to be able to link your work to those kinds of metrics that actually matter to the broader business rather than just locally to your team. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, no, it sounds like lots of heads shaking, heads nodding there in, in agreement. So uh, maybe I'll pass the mic over to Angela. Uh, maybe kind of same question. How did you start your program and was there a goal or a target or some kind of KPI that you guys were, were chasing to, to get started? Yeah, for sure. Um, I I mean, the, like really kind of the infancy of the program began before I joined Unbounce, but what, you know, my kind of understanding of all of it and like where I took the baton over was, uh, was similar to what Carla was explaining, which was there was essentially a, a problem that we needed to solve and it kind of came from um, you know, from the ground up. I think our program really started with people powered efforts. Um, which, which makes sense. I think you want to also kind of validate, uh, you know, some of the problems that we're assuming we have to solve. Um, and so that's kind of really where it began. I think what we're, what we're trying to do now is figure out ways that we can scale those programs. Um, we do have, uh, you know, a customer marketing department that we work with where, you know, they're able to you know, help us with the webinar piece or, or help us with the, you know, big campaigns to try to like educate on mass. Um, and what we're trying to do and, and really focus on and, and how we're measured and what the KPIs are in, in enablement is, um, is more to do with um, like how we're able to connect. So like the actual, like, can we actually connect with customers? And then from that point forward, um, you know, what habits can we help them form? Um, we use uh, a model called the Reforge model um, instead of just kind of using like timeframes. Um, we actually, we really drive product adoption through habit formation. And that's kind of how we measure uh, the success of a customer and, you know, their likelihood to renew and their, um, you know, their lifetime value with us. But also internally, we can, you know, really make action, you know, take actions with specific things that we know uh, are valuable in the product and that will actually have a customer stay with us longer, potentially expand, you know, become an advocate. Um, and so we, I would say we really use those, those metrics and that habit formation to kind of drive adoption, which, uh, for enablement anyways, is really kind of the foundation of our education program. Awesome. That's, that's great to hear. And then how about yourself, Diana? Same questions, I guess, around how did you start and was there a goal or, or a KPR target that you were, you were chasing in the beginning? Sure. Um, I'll mention that. There's a, for me, there's a couple of cues. There's usually a, it's the same triggers at every company, which one of the trigger happens first at your company may change, but it's always kind of the same suspect. And I think this is really helpful for people in the room who are, uh, especially if you're job hunting or you're getting ready to job hunt and you're trying to find, a, a, or you're getting ready to propose a program at your company. Like these are signs to look for that this company might be ready for a customer education program. Um, the most obvious one is, have you reached the point where you have realized that you can no longer keep throwing bodies at this problem? <laughs> have you started hiring just infinite CSMs and someone has looked at the headcount plan and gone, this is unsustainable. We don't have that many people. <laughs> and the people that we have only have so many hours in the day. That's, you, that's the most common wake up call I see at companies. Another one is uh, the, the first one that I ever myself at a previous company was you know sitting up in the middle of the night and realizing customers only hear from us when we launch features that's it <laughs> and I see that a lot with uh with younger companies that somebody realizes that if we don't message them about new features they just never hear from us and it's like all they the only experience they have they have to initiate that's another common trigger so these are all uh depending on which trigger happens first at your company, it kind of helps determine what that KPI might be. Uh, like, are you reducing support tickets because you've proactively served them the resources that they need? Uh, have you reduced the, the number of accounts that each of your CSMs has in their book of business or the amount of, like the amount of ARR that each individual person is carrying, for example? So it, it depends a bit on what that initial trigger is. And all of those are valid and it just depends on where is one part of your company getting ahead of another part of your company? Um, so we started really simple. I've been present at the moment of creation for a couple of programs. And um, <clears throat> I think 
just to kind of piggyback on a lot of the things that Carla said, so I'll, I'll be brief, was um, I usually tend to start with emails before I have anything else because sometimes people just need, they need information and they want to serve themselves. Um, and support articles are the most lightweight, scalable thing. They're the easiest thing to get up and running. They're easiest to iterate or change or edit. So build lots of articles and ship them out to people. As Carla said, the second most iterable, uh, easy, low cost, low friction uh, medium is going to be webinars. So once you have webinars, embed those into your emails. And so you don't have to boil the ocean. And I'm sure John was laughing because I tend to boil the ocean all the time and try to make things overly complicated. But start with emails, emails that link to your support articles. Once you have that in place, start listening in on those CSM calls. If, if your trigger is that your CSMs are having the same calls over and over and over and over again, turn those into webinars, send them out. Like it's, it's just as useful for your customer base to have these resources as it is for your team. This isn't just a this isn't just a favor that you're doing for your CSMs. You are also letting your customers know you don't have to reserve, you don't have to find 30 minutes in your day to meet with me at a convenient time. Watch it at your leisure. Lots of customers prefer that over a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the CSM. I like it. That's that's awesome. I there's certain things that I've I've seen um, that work really well that I think you guys have touched on quite a bit as around. You know, first focusing on the problem, making sure like what is it the thing that we're trying to solve, and I think you you all touched on a couple problems there where it could be you know as Diana as you mentioned and kind of summarized, you know it could be adoption, it could be education, it could be deflecting support, or you're running out of humans in, in along the way, and so if you can define the problem or define the goal of of this program, I always think I always recommend as well like you know just focus on one or two things. Don't try to as I said, Diana, don't boil the entire ocean. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of tools in your tool belt that can help drive that problem or solve that problem. When as you mentioned, the webinars or emails or um, knowledge base and whatnot. And I think what often people do is figure out, you know, a bunch of hypotheses, right? You might think, well, maybe it's a knowledge base that's going to help us deflect tickets out of out of support. We don't really know, but we think that that strategy might help a bit of deflection. And we also think that maybe some webinars will help deflection. And so you're kind of putting together sort of a tool belt or toolkit of a bunch of different theses uh, or theses, I guess, um, and, and applying them to see what kind of, um, you know, what might change uh, that, that behavior and support or that behavior um, in user adoption or, you know, whatever other KPI that you might be driving. That's, you know, it's great to hear kind of all your different positions. It sounds like there's definitely a common theme though in, in some of the things that you guys are applying. Um, was there a particular sort of, when you first started, was there a particular thing that helped you guide your process in defining those campaigns or um, like writing them out? Or do you guys use kind of a user story or some kind of process to, to design these things and then, you know, come to the, you know, deliver in a system or whatever, however you deliver it, and then follow through that kind of those those KPIs. Was there any tools that you guys use to to document these things or, or get started? Uh, yeah, I can start if you want. Um, we actually have, uh, especially at Unbounce, more than many places I've worked, there's a really um, robust experimentation sort of belief. Um, and it, it is actually, uh, in uh, in collaboration with UX, uh, with user research, with a bunch of different kind of cross-functional departments. Um, and I would say that's a big one. And that's actually been uh, a huge amount of learning that we make some assumptions about what we think the customer wants and when they want it and, you know, all of that stuff. And the last uh, two experiments that we've actually run around certain things um, have like not actually moved the needle on any of our metrics at all. Uh, in fact, in some cases, decreased them. Um, so I think like the, which is totally fine. I think we have to accept that we are learning from that and our, our hypothesis and our uh, assumptions were not correct in that. And we kind of learn from that and move on. So I would say that's been, um, that's been a really big, it's not a tool specifically, but we do all sorts of kind of like opportunity trees internally. Um, and then, you know, try to plan things, roll them out and then, you know, use the ex kind of experimentation model. Um, I would say also really being open to learning from them, using the data that you have accessible to you at that time, 
um, and then customize as you learn things throughout. Uh, so that's not a tool specifically, but that's something that I, I have found actually been really, really informative. Sometimes you learn things that you want to, you know, add into product or roll out on scale. And sometimes there are things that you leave behind, but either way you learn something. Can I awesome. back off of something that Angela just said, or Angela said. Um, to me, one of the most important things that you can do before you start anything is make sure that you're in that experimental mindset, because I think the most common problem that I see with customer education programs that are in their initial stages, um, but also one that I see in programs that are scaling really quickly. If you don't have that experimental mindset, I'm defining a hypothesis, I'm going to run this experiment and I'm going to see whether it delivered what I wanted it to deliver or whether it failed. If you don't have that mindset, what you will see constantly is what I call mindless accretion, which is where you throw something at the wall to see if it sticks, but you don't actually know what it means for something to stick to the wall. You don't know what it looks like to succeed or fail. So what will happen is you'll just keep doing it and then somebody else will launch an experiment and then they'll just keep doing it. Nobody ever stops to like look back, review, did that work? They just keep doing it because it's the thing they were doing. And then new people join the company and they'll continue those processes because they were in place when they joined the company. They assume somebody somewhere along the line actually confirmed that that was a useful thing to do. And then someday you will actually sit down, you will audit everything that's going out to customers and you will realize, oh my goodness, <laughs> we're sending lots and lots of emails that don't do anything. We're running programs that don't move any of the needles that we care about. We're overwhelming customers in ways that aren't effective. Like it's, it's very easy uh, to raise the stakes of what it means to experiment. If, if no one is ever going to check your work, if nobody's ever going to see whether it paid off or failed, then it becomes very high risk and very expensive to run an experiment. But if you know that there's going to be this really quick feedback loop, then yeah, try it. See if it works. If it doesn't work, you'll figure that out really soon. <laughs> and, and no harm was done. And you know, one cohort had a negative experience and the next one won't. But if you don't have that mindset in place, experiments, individual experiments become very expensive and they're very cheap if you know that you'll be circling back to, to investigate those results out of, on a regular basis. I love that. That's I'm I'm picturing you all standing there with your lab coats on and your safety goggles and sort of, you know, applying your emails or different campaigns. And so I think I absolutely love that. Um, I think that's, you know, incredibly critical. Is that something, Carla, um, when you when you're kind of throwing on your lab coat and, and safety goggles, um, are, how do you measure the effectiveness of something like a webinar? Like, you know, you're talking about deflection and um, being able to deflect tickets uh, or support tickets. And so how do you, you know, going kind of to what Diana was saying about making sure, you know, this thing sticks and that's gonna drive the ROI that you're expecting. Is there a way that you guys are able to kind of attribute some of the successes of your webinars or, you know, knowledge base or whatnot to your support tickets and your volume there? Yeah, the, the question about attribution between webinars and support tickets, I, I don't, my honest answer is I don't have a, a clear answer on that front. Um, I think I think more we think of the, the knowledge base articles as the support ticket deflection tool and then webinars more as a um, kind of deeper, deeper extension, like learning experience that's more of an extension of what a customer already knows. Um, it's funny, an analogy I've, I've used in the past is like, I think of the knowledge base as um, like if, if, <laughs> if a customer, you know, encountering your product is like they're walking into this new house and they're kind of exploring the house, they come up against these doors that are locked. There's like something they don't understand how to do, something that's confusing to them, and they need someone to unlock the door for them. And the knowledge base articles like unlock the door that they are, that they know they're trying to get through. Whereas deep, these deeper learning programs like webinars, academy, these are more like um, you're like the tour guide in the house and you're like showing them the doors they didn't even know were there. You're like, check it out. There's this amazing attic with all these windows you didn't even know. You wouldn't have even known there was a staircase here. Um, so it's more of the like exposing the unknown unknowns um, 
I'm kind of getting myself off on a tangent here, uh, rather than unblocking, like rather than the unblocking, which I think of as more related to those where those support tickets flow in from. Um, yeah, and I love Diana, what you said about knowing what it means for something to be six to stick, like defining up front, what does it mean for a for an experiment to be successful, I think is really key. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to add to, to this particular piece of the conversation is uh, one of the challenges I've encountered with working in more of an approach is how limited my direct contact with real customers can sometimes be. So um, like maybe I get to in contact a group of customers during a webinar, but I'm really only talking to five of them during the Q&A portion. So one thing that's been really key for our team is what are the avenues through which we can get more direct access to customer feedback and customer experience? Um, some of those for us have been collaborating with our UXR team, um, you know, talking to our CSMs and they're because the, they're the ones who are on the front lines talking to those customers. Um, and, you know, I, I'm looking at this poll and noticing that we all like user adoption is the top, the top thing here, right? Can you talk to a customer who, whose um, team was really successful with getting on board and find out what, what made that true, what made that happen? Can you talk to a, can you find a way to talk to a customer who churned and whose team didn't end up adopting what the product you're using and figure out why they think that happened? Um, so that was the only piece I wanted to add is even though we're in this scaled space, still finding those, those ways to gain access to that direct customer voice, I think is really key. That's awesome. I, I really like how you've integrated in, sort of integrated that human touch. Um, you know, I think that's so important when you realize that something's not going well, ask people, right? That's so important that we often forget about or we, we try to use some analytics maybe too deeply and, and don't think about just human to human interaction to ask. So I really absolutely love that. Um, there's some chatter in the chat around um, being able to, you know, measure emails and understand the success rates of those emails and open click rates and stuff like that. Um, do you guys, uh, and maybe to, to you, Diana, I saw there was some comments around that. Do you guys do, do any of you do A-B testing to see, you know, what's sticking better or what's not sticking? And then how do you kind of talk, uh, go through sort of open and click rates and, and make sure that those things are as effective as possible? John's laughing at me right now. <laughs> if you started asking that, it's just a giant AB that lives behind my head at all times. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes is my firm answer. Um, I, I think it's really important. That, to, honestly, one of the things I found surprising when I first moved into this role uh, was how how valuable email marketing skill sets are. A lot of my first months in my first role in customer education, it was me doing email marketing 101, <laughs> like just research, Googling the heck out of it. Why do I care about conversion rates? Why do I care about AB tests, et cetera? And it's, and it's very helpful because sometimes I get, I, I'll find myself getting lost in the weeds about, uh, you know, things that don't matter as much. Like for example, I can, I can sit here all day and tweak the copy of an email to get more people who are reading my email to click on the call to action, to look at a, an article or sign up for a webinar. But if my open rate is abysmal, no one will ever see that copy. <laughs> it's a waste of time. The three people who opened my email, who cares if they click uh, out of the thousand that I sent that email to? So it's important to like, don't get lost in the weeds, take a step back. Uh, is, is my stuff getting in front of people's eyes? So it, this probably sounds very basic, but in case there's someone who hasn't like done that Googling, it's like, First, focus on your open rate. Make sure that people are looking at your emails. Once they're in the content, now are they taking the action that you want them to take in the content of that email? Whether it's, do you want them to click through? Do you want them to reply? Whatever action and outcome you're trying to get to. Like, first, make sure they're in the email first, and then make sure that they're taking the action that you care about. Um, and so like when I first launched onboarding emails, the, the first KPI that I focused on was just open rate. I just wanted to make sure that, am I sending it to the right audience? Are the, am I defining my audience correctly? Because if so, I should expect to see high open rates. Did a million A-B tests around subject lines. Like, do you keep them short? Do you keep them long? Do they like emojis? Do they not like emojis? Like just little things to get that open rate higher and higher 
And then they started to work on refining the content of those emails to make sure that once they opened it, they found what they were expected to find in that email. So it, it, it's probably really basic to anybody with a background in email marketing, but I didn't have one. So if there's somebody else on this talk who's like that, <laughs> I hope that's helpful. That's awesome. I'm sure there's so much great content out there as well, like um, about how to do like A-B testing and what to try, like different tips and tricks out there, I'm sure on online. Um, so really absolutely love that. Um, Ange, was there anything that um, you guys used? Like are you, you're from a marketing software company, so I'm, <laughs> I'm sure A-B testing is right up your alley as well to some degree. Yeah, we actually, I mean, it's it's native to our product actually. Um, I mean, not not traditional A-B testing, but variant testing, essentially using um, AI and machine learning. Um, so yes, very much part of uh, every conversation, you know, it's, it's, it's very integrated into how we develop the product, et cetera. Um, but listening to that, I think I agree with everything that was shared. I think one thing that I always am kind of interested in, in assessing and reviewing is outside of email, like what else can we be doing to connect with customers and engage with them? Um, and so I think we, we have multiple departments that are really contributing to that. What, you know, what we, what I can kind of uh, influence in, in my department is other ways of communication. So, you know, testing out uh, texting, for example, we've, we've found um, specifically with certain audiences as well, that, te that texting is actually like a huge uh, engagement lever. Um, you know, phone calling at different times. Uh, we, we do have a uh, pretty strong outreach, um, which we're, we're starting to see some kind of diminishing returns on, on the phone calling. I think, especially as people are at home and potentially sitting, you know, feet away from their roommates or partners, people are not wanting to answer the phone as often as they used to, which I find very relatable personally. Um, but also what I, what opportunities that are working in our people powered uh, methods, can we take and ask product to integrate into their roadmap as well? Um, one thing we've done recently is, is moving towards um, more live chat functionality where a customer is in our product, um, which is showing you know, to, be, to be pretty powerful and, and um, having some good results right now. So I think there's gotta be ways also outside of, of email. I know, especially if I start to get repetitive emails, I'm not going to be the one that engages with it the most. So I think kind of thinking creatively, uh, using all your social media forums and all, all of that as well to try to, to try to engage with customers and get our message across and get the value there. I love that. Yeah, it's so way too many email out there. So we're gonna we're gonna jump to the next question as well. So because it kind of correlates to what we've been talking about. And the next question um, is all about what tools are you using to run these campaigns. And so, you know, I suspect like if you're texting or mass texting people or obviously mass emailing, you're probably using something um, to do that. I'm sure you're not manually texting every single person. Um, but yeah, curious, like in the community and the, the audience here today, what tools are you using? I will open up to the panel, maybe Angela, um, do you, maybe we can start with you uh, as a follow-up to, to what you were just saying about um, your mass communications, what, what tools are you using to do that, that activity? Yeah, we primarily use um, Intercom. So our, that's kind of like the, the, the one-to-many and the on-scale uh, communications will come out through, uh, through Intercom. And then there's a few different tools that we use within each team. Um, I would say we're not really running campaigns specifically, but we use Drift as well for communication specifically with our prospects that kind of sit in that pricing page of our, of our website. Um, and then the CSMs are, are using kind of more traditional methods, usually just email. Um, you know, they're pretty intimate with their portfolio. So, you know, they're, they're on that email kind of level basis. Um, and what we also try to do is really funnel our large scale uh, campaigns using intercom into um, into kind of smaller uh, engagements that will actually potentially lead you if you're if you're stuck or you want to know more about something to one to one interaction. So also using intercom as like a funnel, essentially to try to uh, to try to increase. Um, sometimes it's like a specific feature or some kind of adoption campaign as well. And I think Diana, you also use Intercom. I think you mentioned. So I have I have two babies that I, I spend all of my time caring and feeding for. One of them is uh, one of them is Vitally. Vitally, uh, you can it's a CS platform, kind of like a lightweight game site. Uh, it's it's 
I, I've been a huge fan of it. It's much more lightweight CS platform than a lot of the other competitors. I use Vitaly to do all of my, um, basically all of my monitoring. This is where I track customer health. This is where I have dashboards around trends and engagement and adoption, where I can identify trends, where I can identify cohorts and do my segmentation. Everything around defining a cohort and a segment happens in Vitaly. Then it integrates with Intercom. Intercom is what I'm using to manage all of our communications, or at least our one-to-many communications, whether that's uh, onboarding flows, whether it's intervention campaigns, if it's an email, if it's an in-app message, if it's uh, a custom bot interaction, or or a mix of the uh, a mix of all of those things bound up in a series. Uh, the idea is that I do my segmentation and my, my defining who my audience is in Vitaly, and then I push. I tag those accounts and trigger the messaging and all of the messaging uh, is organized through intercom. So that's where I'm tracking my open rates, my, uh, my engagement with the emails themselves, et cetera. And those two tools talk to each other pretty nicely. So I've got a nice closed feedback loop between those two. Uh, everything else that I use just informs or plugs into one of those two tools, but those two are like the, the sun and moon of my world. Yeah, awesome. And how about yourself, Carla? Um, are you guys using anything to do some of that mass emailing or? Yeah, I, I can give the caveat here that um, the email function actually doesn't sit within my team. My my work is a lot more focused on like the learning content and programs, these sort of deeper learning programs. But I can tell you what I know, <laughs> which is um, that historically our CSMs were basically creating their own email sequences. They're, each of them were creating their own email sequences using, I believe they were using outreach. And one of the points of evolution that came about somewhat recently was this decision that we actually need to centralize, standardize, um, sort of take the take the work of developing those sequences off of each individual CSM's plate and dedicate someone full time to developing more strategically developing and testing to Diana's point AB testing a lot of those sequences. So we actually have made the call to, you know, dedicate resources to that role. And that person is actually um, sitting within now sitting within our lifecycle marketing team, which is on the marketing side of things. So to Diana's point about how much this really does draw on email marketing capacities. Um, we're actually, I think, you know, organizing it that way where we're, get, we're getting the benefit of those insights and that, that testing framework from, our, from the marketing side of the house to support those campaigns. That's awesome. And there's a couple other tools that I am not familiar with that you had listed out. Like what, what, um, what's Articulate 360 in and can you talk actually Camtasia is this great tool. I, I am familiar with that one, but I'd love to hear what your how you guys use it and how it helps. Sure. Yeah. So these are more um, like content creation tools. So um, Camtasia is a great tool for easily creating sort of short um, tutorial videos or um, gifs, any kind of uh, visuals. If your product lends itself to those sort of walkthrough type visuals, um, Articulate three hundred and sixty is a um, what's called a content authoring tool which works within a learning management system or LMS to help you create um, self-paced course content. So if you think about um, you know, any online course you've taken recently, LinkedIn Learning, Salesforce Trailhead, whatever you're looking at where you're clicking through and there's little interactions that you can click on, maybe like expand something, um, you know, flip cards to, it's basically a tool to help um, course design, instructional designers create really engaging um, course content. So if you're curious to see what that looks like in action, you can check out our Asana Basics course. We just relaunched it using Articulate. Um, so you can get a sense of what that, what that enables. That's awesome. So there's kind of two sets of tools, I think, or maybe three sets, let's say, where that you guys have touched on. One is all about like segmenting your customer base and figuring out the who's who and what are they doing or uh, you know, what are they touching in the system or, or how often are they logging in? And the other one you were talking about, you know, the email, the distribution of, co of content, let's say. Um, so how do you send that content to the, to the customer or consumer? Um, and then maybe third is that, that those content tools. And I think Camtasia, Articulate, those, sounds like, those sound like great tools that help uh, create content. Was there any other tools that you guys use that you would recommend for like creating or crafting email or like 
just written copy in any shape or form that you guys have used that have been super helpful? I have a shameless plug. <laughs> Uh, at Unbounce, we actually just acquired a company called Snazzy AI, um, and it essentially does exactly what you just described. So it actually takes uh, GPT-3, I think I'm saying that right, technology, which is essentially like using the internet as your database, um, and it writes, uh, it writes copy. It's incredible. It rewrites things, it remixes it, it adds to it, expands on it. Um, so we use that. <laughs> And it doesn't seem robotic at all. It actually seems like incredibly human as well. Like, yeah, and it learns. Uh, it does learn. So we actually have been jokingly using it internally to write cards, like write birthday cards, because we're doing you know ten of those a week basically for for anniversaries and for birthdays. And we've been experimenting in, internally, but it does learn. So the first time the first time you use it is like probably not going to be spot on. But depending on how frequently you're using it and what you're using it for, it does actually learn. And it is it's actually kind of incredible. It's, it's, yeah, I don't want to use the word scary because it's an incredible product, but it's scary how good the, the actual copy it creates is. That's awesome. And such an amazing name as, as John yeah. said in the chat, like sounds pretty snazzy. Yeah. Um, was it, and how about yourself, Diana? Was there anything else that you're using to help with content or AB writing? No, I'm writing those content? down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here, I've got my poster here. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, I'm definitely going to check it out as well. Cause I think there's, it's so hard coming up with like, you know, different versions of the same written content and trying different things all the time. And I mean, uh, English is not my first language. Um, and so, yeah, it's nice to kind of see, like get some other sort of tips from other people on that or, or apps or products. So that's absolutely awesome. Um, and is there, so we're, we're coming to the end almost here of the call and I'll, I'll um, pull in some questions from the audience as well, um, if there's anything that we haven't touched on. But as you, as you were um, working through your various programs and your company here, was there any um, targets or key milestones or key achievements that you were able to reach using all these kind of methodologies and tools that you've talked about um, that you'd love to share? Any key milestones that you've hit uh, at your company or maybe even previous company? Can open up the mic to either one of you. If you'd like an example of one that's just a really nice, uh, like for first, first start, first milestone, um, it was really validating to look through our, our first drip campaign for onboarding and just do a really simple uh, gut check to see whether it's moving the needle. So we have a, we have a customer health scores, uh, which if I have any regret from today, I think we, I wish I'd spoken a bit more about customer health scores, like future, future panel talk alert. Um, but we developed customer health, customer health scores. So we were able to take the temperature of our customer base. We developed, a, you know, our first, baby's first drip campaign, put it out there into the world to help onboard customers. And then we, we looked back and we looked at, uh, you know, we've tagged customers who've completed that journey in Intercom. Now compare the retention rate of those customers versus the customers who didn't receive those emails. And lo and behold, the retention rate for customers who got those emails is higher. And at the end of the day, like, that, that's what we care about. That's what I care about at the end of the day. Everything else is just icing on the cake, but the customers who got those emails stuck with us, they continue to pay us money. And like, that's my, that's my North Star. Everything else I do is a variation on that feedback cycle over and over and over again, a million different ways. That's an awesome mic drop moment that you get to walk into the company and just boom. We just uh, improved a killer retention number or, you know, I always think as well, like if it's retention or expansions, any dollars that you can help the company drive forward, uh, help maintain or, or, you know, or grow, like obviously massive uh, mic drop moments. So that's, that's great to hear. How about yourself, Angela? Um, I would say there's, there's a number of them. We, we use MPS and I think that's a, that's a pretty good kind of gut check for, you know, for your customer sentiment, we use customer effort score to kind of gauge how like internally efficient our processes are and, um, you know, the customers are, are feeling, you know, that's ease, ease of access and ease of use. 
Um, I would say a big kind of like really top level metric is that, you know, with, with the type of work that uh, and the type of product that Unbounce has, which is um, really focused on landing pages and marketing intelligence. Um, one of our big metrics is the conversions that our customers receive, um, you know, with their ad spend and then with their landing pages. Um, and a big milestone for us, us was reaching 1 billion conversions as a company. So we, we hit that in the last little while now, moving the needle, trying to get 5 billion as our next, as our next milestone. So that was a pretty big, uh, pretty, pretty big accomplishment internally. That's awesome. And was there anything on your side, Carla? Yeah, I would say, I would say one of the biggest milestones in my last two years at, at Asana has been um, work that we've done to really develop our relationship with the product team to a point where we've actually, um, started developing a more of an in like a, a dedicated space within our product that's focused on learning and support. So obviously there's, you know, the, your standard help menu, we've been partnering with product much more deeply to figure out like, what would a, what would a deeper support and learning um, experience look like for customers directly within our product? And how can we integrate that with the work of customer education? And ideally in the longer term, how could we then use that space to differentiate and tailor um, from, from a customer success standpoint based on input from CSMs, based on input from the account team. Um, so I think of customer education as one of the most cross-functional functions in, in a business because sales conversations are education, CS conversations are education, marketing content is education as far as I'm concerned, you know, and when customers are navigating product, there's opportunities to educate them there as well. So um, yeah, I would say some of the big milestones for us have been creating some of those really deep partnerships cross-functionally. That's awesome. Those are all amazing moments. And thank you so much for sharing that. And I, I we've just had a couple minutes left, but I wanna kind of go back to some of the gems that you guys had initially talked about in the very beginning. And I want to hopefully maybe just leave everyone with a couple sort of final, final last, last sort of um, statement or, or final moment of Zen, maybe, I guess. Um, and what you would, you know, what you would recommend. I know, Carla, you mentioned the community. Um, there's a Slack channel, I guess, where all sorts of people can talk about some of the stuff, but, um, and what was the, can you, can you just talk us through the, um, the education website as well, and what kind of things people can can see there. Um, you mean the Slack community or the podcast? Uh, sorry, the customereducation.org. Yeah. Um, so customereducation.org, I just dropped the link in the chat. It's just a Slack community where there's a bunch of folks, a bunch of channels on various topics, creating content, um, you know, tools and tools and systems to use. Uh, and from my perspective in customer education, which I think is a relatively new function in the world, um, it's so nice to have a corner of the universe where there's all the people who are doing this similar kind of work. And when you're talking about the stuff you're doing, they're like, oh yeah, I get it. That's, we're trying to do that too. So I can't, I can't speak highly enough about this community. Super great resource also for just crowdsourcing quick ideas from people. It's very active. The conversation is really rich. So uh, I recommend it. That's awesome. And you dropped another nugget there about a podcast. Is that, sorry, I thought the podcast was customereducation.org as well, but what was the, what was the podcast? Oh, no, the podcast is, um, oh gosh, Dave Darrington and Adam Avramescu. Just every, I'm not sure if it's monthly, weekly, are having some kind of fascinating conversation with some customer education or scaled CS leader from the industry um, focused on, on some topic of relevance. So you can check out, they have all the archives right there on the on the site. Awesome. And then how about you, Angela? Uh, was it a book that you recommended, I think? Yeah, it's it was two. It was Scaling Up um, uh, and uh, The Effortless Experience. Um, I would say it depends on kind of really what you're, what you're looking to get. I think the effortless experience, if you are in a customer facing role or managing customer facing, customer facing team, um, it's been kind of like a huge shift for us and a big focus for us. And it'll be a couple of years before we get to the point of, you know, executing on all the plans that we have, but, um, really focused on kind of building customer loyalty and customer retention through an effortless experience and all the opportunities that there are to, you know, to fix, 
uh, to fix certain experiences and certain interactions that a customer would have with us. Um, scaling up is kind of more like an operational Bible. Um, that's been, you know, really useful for kind of more internal, it's more internally operations focused, but it's also been a pretty big game changer. Awesome. And, and yourself, Diana? Uh, just kind of closing the loop. Um, my big recommendation is the book Customer Education, which is written by Adam Avramescu. And for those paying attention, that is the same guy from Carla's podcast recommendation. So this, you know, the world's only this big, there's five people in it. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat to where you can buy it. Um, so this is just basically, Adam Avramescu is now currently the head of a million programs around customer education at Slack. And this is his big book. This is his big guide to customer education. It was uh, the most useful career book I've ever purchased and read. It's a, basically a primer into the industry and will make you look and sound smarter at meetings. And now John knows the secret of how I tricked product board into giving me a job. <laughs> Uh-oh, you won't see me at the next one. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's awesome. That sounds like an awesome resource. I suspect, I, I would imagine that you probably all are very familiar with the content. I mean, Carla, you mentioned the podcast with him. So this guy must be one of the gurus in, in the space. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for your time today. Honestly, um, you know, it was great to hear all, all three experiences and hear about how to best kind of, you know, start with a, you know, a program or start with a problem in mind apply a bunch of different you know, strategies or theories on how to attack that problem. And it was great to hear some of the tools that you guys are using. I definitely jotted some notes uh, for myself and my team uh, at PTC. So thank you so much for your time again. And thank you everyone for, for attending and taking the time out of your day. Um, and maybe you know, with, with that, we'll, uh, we'll close it off. And I hope you guys all get out there and enjoy the sun. And we'll see you next uh, at our next event, uh, hopefully in another month or so. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.